In this video, I want to continue the, our talk of the pentose phosphate pathway and talk a little bit more about the non-oxidative phase because in the previous video, we kind of focused a little bit more on the oxidative phase. We said in the last video that the pentose phosphate pathway produced two things. Those two things were NADPH and ribulose 5-phosphate. And we said that the NADPH provided reducing power for biosynthesis for anabolic pathways, and then ribulose 5-phosphate was used as a precursor to different nucleic acid synthesis. Okay. Now, ribulose 5-phosphate, I've drawn it here. It's, in the last video, I referred to it as R5P. In this video, and henceforth, I will refer to it as RU5P. And the reason why is because ribulose 5-phosphate can be turned into this other molecule here called ribose 5-phosphate, and that's something we mentioned in the previous video kind, or at least we hinted at it, we said that ribulose sounds a lot like ribose. So ribulose can be turned into ribose 5-phosphate, and now ribose 5-phosphate is something I will actually refer to as R5P henceforth. The enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called phosphopentose isomerase. Phosphopentose isomerase, and that name makes sense. Both of these um, compounds are Pentoses, they are five carbon sugars that have phosphate groups, so phosphopentose makes sense. And isomerase makes sense because they're only slightly different. Ribulose 5-phosphate is a ketose, right? It has this carbonyl here in between two carbons, whereas ribose 5-phosphate is an aldose. It has its uh, carbonyl up here as an aldehyde. Okay. Now this ribose 5-phosphate is, of course, a precursor to many biomolecules, including some nucleic acids. Okay, so... Now, further, things we should already know from the previous video is that pentose phosphate pathway, the pentose phosphate pathway, diverts off of glycolysis at G6P, glucose 6-phosphate. So once glucose 6-phosphate is created, it can either continue in glycolysis or go to the pentose phosphate pathway. Another thing that we should already know is that the oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate pathway makes NADPH and ribulose 5-phosphate, which of course can be turned into ribose 5-phosphate from that reaction we've just seen there. Okay. Now, we talk about the non-oxidative phase, we'll talk about it in more details in just a second, but we should be familiar at least to a certain extent with these terms here. So, I'm going to be referring to things mostly by these abbreviations here. These are all a bunch of monosaccharides, so RU5P and R5P ribulose 5-phosphate and ribose 5-phosphate are both five carbon molecules that we've already encountered. But the rest of these things here, X5P, xylulose 5-phosphate, G3P, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, S7P, cetoheptulose 7-phosphate, E4P, erythrose 4-phosphate, and F6P, fructose 6-phosphate. I'm not actually going to be drawing all of these different things, so I'm just going to be referring to them by their abbreviations. But what's most important is that you recognize how many carbons each one of these molecules is, and that'll help you understand the pathway. So X5P is a far carbon molecule, and actually any the numbers here actually refer to how many carbons there there are. No, they don't refer to it. the The number indicates where the phosphate is, but those the phosphates are all on the ends of these carbon chains. So glyceraldehyde three phosphate is a three carbon molecule. Cetoheptulose, seven carbons. Erythrose four phosphate, four carbons, fructose 6-phosphate, six carbons. We've actually seen glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate before in glycolysis. Okay, let's move on to the actual non-oxidative phase. Now, if you recall, we talked about it or we mentioned it in the previous video as being just a series of carbon shuffling reactions or moving carbons around. So what is the overall process, though? In the overall process, we're taking three ribulose 5-phosphates and turning them into two F6Ps and one G3P. Let's see if that makes sense. If we have three 5-carbon molecules here, that's a total of 15 carbons that we're starting off with. So how many carbons do we have over here? Well, F6P we said was a 6-carbon molecule. G3P was a 3-carbon molecule. So the total number of carbons that we have here is 12 carbons, and here three carbons for a total, of course, of 15 carbons. We go from 15 carbons to 15 carbons, so everything's cool there. So something that you should bear in mind about this process, if we're starting off with three ribulose 5-phosphates and turning them into two, two F6Ps and one G3P, 
it's important to recognize that all of these reactions are reversible. Okay, that's very, very important. I'll get to the, get to why later. So let's say we start off with three ribulose 5-phosphates, okay, like we set up here in the overall process. So we said that RU5P can be turned into R5P, right, another 5-carbon molecule. It can also be turned into X5P, so xylulose 5-phosphate. Now, if we have three ribulose 5-phosphates, and we're going to turn them into R5P and X5P, we're going to have two of one of, two of, of, one of these and one of the other. We're actually going to make one ribulose 5-phosphate, or ribose 5-phosphate, excuse me, R5P, and two X5Ps. This top reaction here we just mentioned earlier is that phosphopentose isomerase catalyzes that reaction to go from RU5P to X5P. It's a different enzyme called phosphopentose epimerase, and um, epimers are actually just diastereomers that differ in chirality at only one chiral center. I encourage you to go back and look through the structures of all these different compounds, um, but I did not draw them in this video just for simplicity's sake. And before we can actually talk about the steps and the reactions of the non-oxidative phase, we have to understand this simple detail here. There are enzymes called transketolases and there are enzymes called transaldolases. The transketolases catalyze reactions that transfer two carbons and transaldolases transfer three carbons in the reactions. Okay, so let's get into the actual steps for the reactions of this pathway. First step, we're going to take one X5P and one R5P, which are each both five carbon molecules, and we're going to turn them into one G3P and one S7P, okay, which is one three carbon molecule and one seven carbon molecule. Now, specifically, we're going to take this one X5P and turn it into this G3P. So we're going from a five carbon molecule to a three carbon molecule, and then we're going to take this R5P and turn it into this S7P. So what happened? Basically, well actually let's think about this. Which enzyme catalyzed this step? A transaldolase or a transketolase? Well, if we went from X5P to G3P, that means we lost two carbons there, right? Well, what happened to those two carbons? R5P went from five carbons to seven carbons, so it must have gained those two carbons. So we had a two carbon transfer here. We had a, we, that means we had a two-carbon donor and a two-carbon acceptor. The donor is on the, the, the X5P because it lost those two carbons, and R5P is the acceptor because it gained those two carbons. Since it was a two-carbon transfer, that means we had a transketolase catalyzing this reaction. Cool. That's pretty much it for the first step. So how many RU5P equivalents have we used so far? Well, we have one X5P and one R5P, so that's two of them. Both of those are five carbon equivalents that came from RU5P. So we had one X5P and one R5P used. In the second step, we're going to take this G3P and S7P that we made, and we're going to turn them into F6P and E4P. Specifically, this G3P will be turned into F6P, and this S7P will be turned into E4P. So how many carbons were transferred? Well, if we went from a three carbon molecule to a six carbon molecule, it means we gained three carbons there, and then those three carbons must have been lost by the S7P. So we had a three carbon transfer, so we have a three carbon donor and a three carbon acceptor, the three carbon acceptor is the G3P because it gained three carbons to become an F6P. So we have the acceptor was G3P. S7P was the donor because it lost those three carbons. So S7P here. And if this was a three carbon uh, transfer, then it must have been a transaldolase that catalyzed this reaction. That's it for the second reaction or the second step. So, so far, how many RU5P equivalents have we used? Well, still just two, right? We, we had the one X5P and the one R5P that we used up in the first step, 
and those things were returned into the G3P and S7P. So we haven't used that third equivalent yet. In this third step, third reaction, we're taking an X5P and an E4P that we just created. So we just we took this E4P here that we just created, and we're adding an X5P. So this X5P is going to be turned into this G3P. So here we're going from here to here, and then this E4P will be turned into this F6P. So this thing gained two carbons, right, going from four to six. And this thing lost two carbons. So we had a two carbon transfer. That means we had a two carbon donor and an acceptor. The donor was X5P because it lost the carbons. E4P gained them. So it was the acceptor. And this, of course, then, because of the two carbon transfer, was catalyzed by a transketolase. At this point, how many RU5P equivalents have we used so far? Well, now we've used all three, right? We had the initial one, um, we had that one X5P and the one R5P from the first step, and now we just use this one X5P here. So we've used all of them. Okay, so now we said before that the overall reaction was going to take three RU5Ps and turn them into two F6Ps and one G3P. How did that actually happen? Well, we should be able to go back and uh, look at these three steps and think to ourselves, okay, uh, what did we create and what did we use up? Okay, so here in that first step at the top, we took an X5P and turned it into a G3P, X5P and an R5P, turned it into a G3P and an S7P. Those, that one G3P and S7P were both used up. So we can go ahead and cross this here. Anything that's on the, both the left and right side, right, we can cross that off because it's created and then it's used up. Created and used up. So those shouldn't be in the overall reaction. And same thing with this E4P here. Had it, we created it, and then we used it up. So what do we have left over? Okay, on the left side of the reaction, we have one X5P and one R5P here. That's two uh, RU5P equivalents, and here's the third one here. So on the left side, we have the three RU5Ps, and on the right side, nothing there. We have one F6P here, one F6P here, and one G3P here. So that is two F6Ps and one G3Ps. So we basically took three ribulose 5-phosphates and turned them into two F6Ps and one G3P. What do we notice about these two compounds? They are actually glycolytic intermediates. So they're from glycolysis. So if we have a lot of RU5P, and they have, if there's, if it's an excess, then that means we'll create a lot of F6P and, and G3P, and those things can go to glycolysis. So if there's an excess, glycolysis can happen. Okay, but this is kind of weird. Wait a minute. I thought we said in the previous video that the non-oxidative phase makes R5P when NADPH is not needed. What happened? Why did we create F6P and G3P? That doesn't make any sense. Remember, the reactions are reversible. That's what's important here. So basically, if we have F6P and G3P, we can go backwards and create a bunch of R RU5P and R R5P, and we can make a bunch of this, okay? So we can go the other way, okay? So we go backwards and make R5P without making NADPH. Because if you go back and look at all the steps that we just talked about, none of them mentioned NADPH. So there's no NADPH or NADP plus at all. So if we run this reaction backwards, we can create R5P without making NADPH. Hope that video was helpful.